Hello there, everyone, and welcome back to TNO, the last days of Europe. I'm your host, Mr. Luhan Lover, but Long Yoon joins NPA. The room was dimly lit, but only added to the atmosphere. This was a secret meeting, the one in which the dogs of the government had no clue what was happening. To the somber, flickering glow of a lantern, Long Yoon stood in front of men covered in the scars of battle. Still wearing the rivals as a mark of the fight that would not end until every last tendril of the Empire of Japan had been burned from China. I will ensure that Luhan's men will not touch one hair on your heads as long as I remain within the government. And when the time comes, I will join you. Together we will drive out the past and pass our motherland together. A sharp clack echoed through the room as the NPA all clicked their heels together and saluted in unison. They found it difficult to breathe as emotion caught in their throat. Finally, he had returned. Finally, the king knew none stood before them. We'll fight to our last breath, and then after that, may the final drop of our blood be shed in the perseverance and protection of our motherland. Long Yun watched the men as they filed out, their shadows dancing against the walls of flame, and the lantern sputtered out or sputtered and jolted. They would be the fire that would burn the locusts out of China. They would be the torch of pine, roaring with anger and righteous indignation. And it would be Atilaba, Atilaba, guiding the torch until its duty had been done and justice restored. And all the land would rejoice and peace and prosperity came at last, or so he hoped. Nice. So he's not here yet, but we still have the bottom line to do, of course. Um, I'll be honest, I don't remember, I, I don't remember if I read this yet, but... The economy of Xinan has come a long way, but it is a tremendous weight and is pulled by many hands in many directions. Strong hands, to be sure, yet these hands would all be the stronger if they only could pull in unison. The time has come to centralize the Bureau of Expansion, Efficiency, and Exploitation, the Central Investment Bank of Kunming, and the various local boards of agriculture in one unified economic command. Just as an army needs a single leader, so must all of Xinan's economy must have a single supreme controller. Now we've laid the foundations deep and strong, we have the opportunity to calibrate and fine tune the economy until it slings. Our newly unified Office of Economic Development will put our surveyors and inspectors to work finding the fat to trim and the shaft to shed. We'll determine exactly how little we need to give a worker for them to keep on working at maximum efficiency. We shall determine exactly how to get the most wealth out of our mines, farms, and factories year after year. We shall build a new leaner society, one where we do not suffer from waste of corruption. In pursuit of this goal, there is only one singular line we are unwilling to cross, the bottom line. Now, I might have read that earlier. My apologies, but showing up weaknesses. Our authorities over the province, now provinces, has always been dubious. Now, our position is more in question than ever before, with insurgents, partisans, of bandits haunting the countryside, and the army paralyzed by conspiracy and squ squabbling. Luhan will consolidate his control over Xinhua by building up the main roads and expanding the ter territory's transport networks, ultimately better connecting our lands to that of the Nanjing government through the road from Kunming to Chongqing. Our other key objectives will include securing the cooperation of Xinan's landlords through bribery and exchanging favors to strengthen our influence and clout, and seeking investment from Nanjing and Tokyo in order to facilitate local economic development and exploitation of our abundance of natural resources, ensuring that we are financially and materially equipped. The bottom line. No suffocating the auditorium. Not so much because of the heat outside, but because of the press of bodies throughout the Communist Party of China's compound deep in the mountains. The call had gone out weeks ago that the party would be hosting a meeting and that they would be deciding on a plan of action for uh, Yunnan's peasants and labor to advance its plan of liberation. If on Hu or Hao Zhu, his sleeves rolled up to deliver that plan, he stepped onto the stage and looked out at the bodies. Comrades, you have worked hard these past few months. The fruits of your labor are evident in every aspect of life. Already the bosses and landlords are celebrating the increases in agricultural production. Howell fell silent and watched as the union leaders muttered, wiping sweat off their brows. Beneath the pathetic whirling of the fans, he caught scattered complaints. The oppressors had been working them ragged, and the ban on unions meant that there was no one to advocate for them. The people were chaffing under the strain of the government's new regulations. But we must be patient. The committee decided that it's not yet time to strike, even as the country grows less, as we must. Howell did not have the opportunity to finish his speech before the crowd began to roar in frustration. He gave several futile efforts to regain control before stepping aside and watching gum glumly, as screaming and arguing consumed the workers. He did not know how much longer the people could wait. The people demand action, and though the lo lotus root may be cut. When Zhang Zhisheng and Anpu heard that the National Protection Army of Yunnan secretly assisted the NRA remnants scattered outside of Yunnan with money, materials, weapons, and the like, it came as no surprise to them. They said as much to the man they called Zizhu, but he was deep in thought with a smile on his face. That was because Long Yun was pleasantly surprised, very much so, in fact. He not expected that brave resistors, still less the household names like Song Jilian, Li Mi, Zing Chong, would still be alive and kicking the Japanese Imperials and the running dogs in the teeth. Even better, it warmed his heart beyond belief to know that neither he nor they were alone for Zhang. For Zhang and An had told him, countless were the bravest civilians offering aid and succor to the brave resistance forces, even though the Japanese Imperialist bastards had won two decades ago. Leaving his re reverie, Long looked at his two fellow resistance fires and stood up. It was his turn now to fight for the freedom of the Chinese people and the nation he and so many loved so deeply. Its fiber threads still connected. And additionally, we do have some comments to go through, such as, yeah? Somewhere along the line it went from, We need a strong nation to eventually break free for, to, Screw the peasants, more profit. Someone says, Can you do another Age of Imperialism campaign and return to the Red World? Yeah, probably eventually. Uh, someone says, oh, I mixed up my thumbnail titles, one and two, so yeah. 
Uh, let's see what else. And a lot of comments as well. Great, 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 great. But, Taming the Land, not bad. Uh, draw closer to China. Landlords must have their say. Ooh, I don't want to lose any more political power, man. Look the other way. You get 10% more there. Minus 10%. Plus 10%. And then what? Heed their advice. Income... Change income from genome development by almost 0.1 billion. A government... Uh, friends. Eh, I don't know about that. More political power is always good. Oh, that's a lot more political power. Economic ties with export focuses. Not bad either. Team of the land is not bad. Get infrastructure is not terrible. Uh, railroads would be pretty nice. Very infrastructure expansion and industrial construction projects. Let's go with, draw closer to China. 10,000 strings connect every organ of the sphere to its beating heart in Japan. For much of the sphere, their entire foreign policy is dictated by Tokyo, not just by law, but by practice. It's far easier for fledging and unstable regimes to allow the interests of Japan to control them, but such submissive compliance is impossible for a great state such as Yunnan to contemplate. We've done a thorough examination of our diplomatic corps, and with the rest of the afternoon, we have formulated a plan as to how to further our diplomatic needs. We do this not only for the sake of Xinan, but for the sake of all of China. Decades of infighting between the Chinese nations has led to our ruination. Like a body, each part of China must work in tandem towards a common goal of mutual enrichment. Xinan is an ideal state. A great state to lead the way towards this unity. In our nation, we have achieved unity between the Yi landowners and the Han workers. Wife and husband, father and son, master and servant, almost sacrifice their selfish personal needs for the greater goods of Xinan and, by extension, of China, of course. We're still losing... This keeps getting stronger. I don't understand. There's nothing else we can do about this. It just it seems like it's just randomly just getting stronger, which is kind of annoying, to be honest. Kind of annoying. Uh, get more defense. We'll definitely go need that. More industry. Showing up weaknesses. The boy looked... Oh. Or increase in admin efficiency, finally. If you don't know about that, please go ahead. But, look at all that lag. The boy looked young, 18, perhaps even younger. He'd been a handsome thing, too, before Xi Cheng, Cheng, King Chen has been and captured him. Over the course of his interrogation, Xi had walked into the soft, sensitive features, vanished beneath a mass of red and purple. His nose bent at a sharp, unnatural angle. He made strange, good old noises when he tried to breathe. <clears throat> that was a depressing sight. Not one that you relish, but he was only doing his job as a patriotic soldier in China. The KMT needed to be stopped and its members identified. It was the only way to promote stability, the only way to keep Yunnan safe amid its isolation. Xi wiped off the blood from his hands and knelt beside the prisoner. Listen, Xi said, trying to affect his reassuring tone of a kind uncle. I'm sure you're a good kid. You'll probably have a father, mother, people who care about you. They wouldn't want you to throw your life away like this. He watched as a mixture of blood and tears seeped from the child's face. Xi removed a handkerchief from his pocket and dabbed at the prisoner's eyes. You can still go back home. All we need is a... Uh, a little information on the people who have tricked you into this. You can tell us their names, right? Where those people might be right now. There were more tears trembling. The boys mumbled something incoherent through his ruined, blood-filled mouth. Then, without looking him in the face, he shook his head. No, I will not say anything. Xi continued kneeling. He brushed away the prisoner's hair and looked at him with a forlorn expression. Oh, you sweet boy, he said. You stupid sweet boy. Our child ought to continue until we get answers. Oh, connections. In our efforts to build a diplomatic service, we had a brief, insignificant snag that no one in the great state of Jinan knows how to run a modern diplomatic service. No matter what, no matter whatsoever, as a senior and only minister of our old diplomatic corps has accidentally delivered us our salvation. As our internal security office was routinely reading his mail, we were discovered that he had many friends with diplomatic experience all over China, and that many of these friends are either already retired or looking for a quieter life. We shall send these letters, friends, offering uh, friends letters, offering them a position in Xinan's new diplomatic service training, the next generation of our new diplomats. We we'll also ask them to reach our to all of our their friends, and so on forth until the vast network of diplomatic friendships brings his bounty to our doorstep. The majority of retired diplomats live in the reorganized government. We will send an agent into the east with his pocket stopped with gold and strict instructions to return with diplomats ready to work for us in the meantime or to kill himself and save us the trouble. We have complete faith in his ability to acquire di diplomats with or without their consent. And we don't want consent here, I guess. I don't know. Carrot and the stick. I want more admin efficiency and stuff like that, but we don't have enough guns right now, so I'll take whatever we can get. NPA, NRA. Uh, bandits. Focus on the bandits. Yeah, this one doesn't have really too much here. Of course, we have done some more of this stuff, but, you know, whatever. Oh, connections. How's the economy actually doing right now? Quite a bit better. Wow. It's doing quite well, actually. New friends. It's been, a, it's been pointed out so by a junior minister in the foreign office who thinks he's smart that there are other places in the world than China and that we have no need to limit ourselves. After being fired for being wrong, we do in fact need to limit ourselves as much as possible to just a sphere. We'll quietly admit that he was equally wrong. There are indeed other places in the world other than China. 
We're not going to pull off the same brilliant trick we pulled off last time in our diplomatic corps. The very few people whose mail we can open that have friends in the wider sphere. For this reason, we're sending our series of recently recruited diplomats and attaches to make contacts with neighbors to the west and south. These agents are under orders to create not only our first proper official channels with these nations, but to also foster personal channels. When dealing with foreigners, it's always more curious to speak their language than your own. It's also sometimes curious to hide our conversations from eyes that would disapprove. We do this for the benefit of others, such is the science of polite lightness in this great state of Jinan. Oh, there goes Borman doing their stuff, and... Oh, we're actually making a positive amount now. Rewards for the meek. Gardens of Luhan, the one he specifically picked from the best and most faithful troops to be his personal bodyguards, were waiting for the man to be dressed to dress up. It was essential to have young... Or at least men, not young men, you can trust on your side. Moreover, today was a day that Luhan would have to face as many different officers and collaborators of the army, with threats of insurgency being all, almost ubiquitous. Lu has to have his men loyal and tamed as ever, for this he must be, get ready to listen to their excuses, problems, and lies. The military officers downstairs were waiting for him, speaking between each other about bandits they had fought with yesterday, complaining about their wives and worrying for some, or for some reason, getting excited about what Luhan would say to them. When Master Lu stepped inside the conference room, the smile rested upon his face, his wrinkled lips at least, it yet emanated an uncanny aura. The officers held their breath and started saluting the Master, so he started speaking. Proud boys of our army, I've heard a lot of rumors surrounding us about an insurgency or resistance going around in our lands, and as we believe, they are nothing but lies to create chaos in our army, but still, I assure you to be mindful of any troubles. In the case of something critical, I want you to report them directly to me, Master Lu said, against a crowd staring at him with full force, or full focus, and distrustful faces. Oh, drop your cold approach. One of the reasons I've called each of you here today is to award your deeds of Yunnan, said Luhan with a smirk. They had moved to call servants to bring a case full of medals and started awarding them to the officers. They had not been expecting this, but they were really joyful about the whole situation. The crowd of officers started applauding Master Lu with the award ceremony over. He asked the officers to move to a table with a map on it and began to draw lines to give the best officers a piece of land to own. <clears throat> uh, with many other gifts, such as giving them an increase on their salaries. Much as he was repulsed by giving them this many offerings, the loyalty of his men was the utmost concern right now. Sometimes loyalty can only be bought with money. Go with that. We can try, but like it's ridiculously high, so. Army expenditures is really flipping high. Actually, we could get more. Natural growth is 0.3. Which means even higher than next time. It's gonna hurt the economy. Oh well. Economic ties. A very foolish man once said talk is cheap. Clearly, whoever said this never had to build a diplomatic corps for nothing. Talk is expensive. Ludicrously expensive. The cost of the parties and the suits alone make the make the more economically conservative elements in our government throw their hands up in despair. We spend more on paper every day than most of our villages make in a year. All this money for what? For profit, of course. For the financial gains of the city, great city of Jinan. Down the lines of communication will flow cold hard cash, and with it our diplomatic efforts will be strengthened tenfold. When the factory cannot work if our cold doesn't reach it, the government will have an incentive to work with us. When we're their biggest customer, they can care about what we have to say. Just in case it can help them sell a little bit more. When peasants go hungry because the governments aren't playing ball with the great state of Jinan, those governments will play nice or be replaced by one that will. Chains of iron are weak when they're compared to the invincibility of chains of gold. Nice. Pirate, expertise, growth, new friends. Ooh, we got a lot of political power. The red phone on Luhan's desk rang violently. It picked it up, uncertain as to who could be calling him so early. Governor Lu Jinan speaking. Good morning, Mr. Lu. Ah, the mild voice behind the telephone cable belonged to one other, none other than President Gao. That's the president. I'd like to ask about the status of development in Yunnan. Lu pinched the bridge of his nose, a slight sigh escaping his lips. Nanjing always had expectation after expectation of his far-flung governors. He can only hope that Gao... Uh, would not be as unreasonable as some other members of the so-called reorganized government had been previously. A pleasure, Mr. Gao. With the re recent unification of the Southwest under my governorship, great work has been done in integrating the economies of Yunnan and Guizhou. Local business and trade is booming. While, Meanwhile, my recent schemes to improve Yunnan's roads and expand the mining industry are also bearing fruit. Good. I expect this growth to be sustained for the you and your government to continue directing the economy of Yunnan towards modernity. A pause. And I am willing to all allocate more funding to your province should you succeed in delivering results. Luan thinly smiled to himself, well, thank you, but we also need funding in order to continue development. And the landlords and companies which are overseeing seeing the mineral boom need capital for their ventures, too. To earn money, we must first spend it, of course, and if you're so generous to give you not a chance, well, I would be deeply gracious, no? Gal curtly chuckled, yes, and we all benefit. I see your point. Very well, your progress does seem promising, so perhaps I could trust you with a budget increase. I'll speak to my ministers. Fine art of diplomacy, though. So we have those divisions. Yeah, and these guys are only 12 commas, which suck. I just hope we can do well here, man. All right. Oh, yeah. Why not? Carrot and the stick. We have bandits on the MPA, but yeah, I mean these guys are rising up a little bit too. Uh, 
Twitter don't give me political power anyways. NRA. You know what, try. Oh, wow. All right, we can't do this one yet because we need more infantry equipment. So we Dali. Why not? We'll try that one. Why not? It did help out slightly. Garen and Stick would be bad, but. All right, not bad. Economic ties. Uh, we'll probably tame the line because I don't want to do lose political power here. So, a vast and pertinent forest covers much as you know, and its cavernous canopy covers a whole world of beauty. And a biodiverse paradise that showcases every one of the natural world has to offer the inquisitive and curious mind. In such a tragic way, so our villages, farms, and mines are isolated by mile upon mile of unprofitable, unnavigable force. If we ever hope to build a modern infrastructure worthy of the great state as you know, we must approach force like a gentleman approaches a beard. Or beard. Keeping only what tradition and decorum demands and removing the rest of the, mo the moment it threatens to grow back. This end, we're hiring private contractors based in Japan who specialize in lumber and deforestation. Land as you know is wild, fierce, and beautiful, but so is a wolf. As you know does not need a wolf, and we need what we need is a dog. We don't care how many wolves have to die, we'll, we'll have to get a dog. We'll get it. Surgencies are acting up, huh? Oh, look at that. Tap the mine, tap the box out in there. Uh, do we, what do we need here? Economy wise, I mean, getting more stuff in general is always good, but. Oil and rubber. Steel. Um, aluminum. Could probably use more steel, in all honesty. I'll we'll probably go with steel first. Nice. I'll get that one too, because again. And serve equal to. Guys, it's going to hurt a spot, whatever. Hey, more military factories, nice. Should really say just production units, though. Are we missing anything gun-wise? We're doing very quite well on it, so... Um, do we have any planes, actually? That might be not worth getting. Maybe I could be wrong, but you can try that. Plant in the soil. Mother Nature's a traitor. If we could bring her to court, we would. A case of treason this clear cut would not take so long. From accusation of firing squad in under an hour, alas, we must spend long months fighting her, but like any enemy of the great city, as you know, we'll put her down. Specifically, we will rely on her to better please us. Hills and valleys, hills and valleys, endless hills and valleys shall be raised and raised for our ends. Farms, roads, railway lines all demand that the earth be at least nominally flat. Some of our local officials disagree with this assessment. They sell the idiotic masses of peasants who will wail incoherently about tradition and sanity. This trade suggests that Xinan was just fine doing what it had done for centuries, working towards around nature, to the best of her ability, changing what little we could and accommodating the rest. To show these naysayers the errors of their ways, we'll let them join the work gangs who will twist the impurities of chance into the into the perfection of design. Their defeat is in natural facilities or fallacies. We'll expunge the minds of reform by labor into forward thinking, correct models. Yunnan can no longer stand idly by and allow nature to dictate what it can or cannot do. We're the masters of our destiny. <clears throat> Focus on who now? Bandits? Yeah, they're Ooh, going down now a little bit more. Do that one. Yeah, too. How's the economy looking? Hey, not bad. Seven percent. Oh, we actually had a little bit. Oh. oh, yeah, less than fifty percent. Not bad. Lay down the roads. Two thousand years ago, the Emperor of Wu, of uh, the Han Dynasty, brought much of what is now the Jinan under Han jurisdiction. Even this ancient time, the state knew well that the function of the government was to control, extract, and provide. Nothing's more central to this effort than roads. They enable us to control the land and the movement of the people alongside it. They make the extraction of wealth incalculably more efficient as truck after truck of <clears throat> our produce rushes to the border. Finally, they provide for our people in a way that only a government can. That's unfortunate, then, that the thousands of truck drivers would easily believe that the roads they use today are 2,000 years old as well. Like all glorious nations in the history, Jinan will be a builder of roads. Only the best roads will suffice, but we are well prepared. We already have exerted a superhuman effort making way for roads. Now we shall make another superhuman effort to lay down the roads for themselves. We'll make superhuman effort after superhuman effort until Jinan is the greatest road network in Asia. We'll have no more peasants to throw at the problem. The Southwest Barbarian Circuit will be restored in a state more splendid than any alive in the age of Han could imagine. We'll also need to think of a better name. Flatten soil. Do you think those efforts got off from eating Luhan's crap or anything anyone's do? 
Chao and other members of his chain gang were standing in a large valley in the northern part of Yunnan, watching as a black plume of smoke rose skyward for the last couple of days. As part of some BS order given by some BS bureaucrat, he and hundreds of other prisoners have been deployed across the country to rebel China, while other prisoners were repairing bridges or building apartment blocks. He and his crew had been given explosives and told to fly in the valley to make way for some roads. At least that was the idea. No, no, said Chow in a sweet, mocking voice. He gestured towards the rubble strewn hill where several prisoners were setting up explosives, getting ready to clear it. <clears throat> uh, we must salute these patriotic sons of China. It's only through their hard work that a countryman can prosper, he leaned forward. Because the fewer explosives in the black market, the more we can charge for it. The crew erupted in their laughter. While the morons across the valley were content on following orders, Chow and his crew saw a little reason to help a government of traders do anything. Better to pursue this the far more lucrative business of selling to bandits, of helping them destroy convoys and launch robberies. These bandits were straight about their motives. What kind of fool gives explosives to criminals? That's a good point. Yeah, I definitely want that one too, I and mean, we definitely need it, but let's get this stuff first. More production units. Max that stuff out as much as possible. Is this still going up? It's, it's finally going down, thank God. And it's not go really going down, but whatever. That's going way, way, way down, but the Zealot make his rounds. And actually, with this, that's actually looking pretty nice. And now we get even more stability, hopefully, and more GDP stuff. But today, Xiang was ready for his monthly job after finishing his various college lectures and duties. Paying a visit <clears throat> to the platform that sent trains from Kunming to Haiphong, he sent a letter, a group of volunteers on board to their destination, Vietnam. According to Xiang's organization, Vietnam had a need for Yunnanese volunteers for the purpose of furthering the cause of Pan Asianism. With Xiang's fluent Japanese, the officers had no reason to doubt him, happily giving him the tickets he needed. But that's not his only mission. Another train was on its way to Kunming, coming in a different platform, and he was responsible for taking away the cargo that had been sent to him. Inside the cargo was supplies needed for his peers in the organization he ran. The average observer believed it was merely Jiang being very generous to the students and staff as always. Even that wasn't the end of Jiang's work. Though somebody had to greet. And yet, and yet another platform, a passenger came off the train and shook his hand. Exchanging greetings and letters, they left the station together, going to the NSAU library to share thoughts and experience. Obviously, no one would doubt that given Zhang's identity, Wang Xiao Yu was waiting for them in the library. Zhang and his companions seemed to expect this. After entering a private room owned by a student body, or student society, Zhang ensured that no one would sneak in. The door was locked and the window was blocked before Zhang turned to exchanging secret signs and gestures with those already in the room. Signs and gestures known only to the underground cadres of the Communist Party. Heavens, there really is more to this man than we thought. Strengthen the Burma Road. Though the Burma Road has been reconstructed and is in a far better state than it was back when the Allies abandoned it, its operation still leaves much to be desired. There are still some potholes here and there, as well as several stretches that could be improved. More critically, however, there is the issue of banditry and rebellions along its route to deal with. Obviously, this should not be tolerated for much longer. Let us send a crew of soldiers and construction workers to improve and secure the Burma Road to the best of their ability for a strong and more prosperous genome. The Zealot's plan. The revolution's not long from coming, as Zhang said to his occasional visitor from Nanjing. How can you be so sure, the visitor said. Was well, quite simple. Wang replied, from what we've been able to gather from our underground network, Long Yun has joined the NPA and is waiting for the perfect moment to pull Luhan down from the throne. Of course, this means war with the puppet regime and the Japanese imperialists. The visitor nodded. You must be really busy then, Professor Jiang. Jiang let out a breath. You're right, sir. Since then, Mr. Wang and I have been really busy. I've even abandoned part of his teaching duties. We've been recruiting every dissident that we can find to expand the movement's base. We're also planning to con contact the resistance in Sichuan and notify them to stay prepared for the inevitable. I've been preparing to send them all the resources we have collected from Vietnam so far. Wang took up the conversation. We're all secretly conveying to Long Yun and the NPA that the CCP remain remnants are willing to fight under Long's banner with the same goal of China's liberation. Given the general sympathy towards them and its familiarity with the higher ups, they shouldn't be taking too much effort. Of course, there are always some things that can only be shared with the NPA once the situation is stabilized. Jiang ended the discussion, but for now, those will suffice uh, that the visitor smiled widely. Some days later, Zhang was Zhang's guest was at the station. Jing and Wang were there to bid him farewell. Maybe we see you again someday, sir. Make sure to tell the madam I to wait for the good news. With pleasure, the visitor said. What are we doing for this? Five's not bad. Hey, power's getting better, too. Laying down the road. The Valley Clearing Project was meant to take a week, but Chow and his fellow prisoners have found ways to stretch the project beyond logic and reason. Days stretched into weeks. Weeks mutated into months. Orders for new explosives went to the government, and like magic, were answered without question. Now that dumbass in charge has seemingly made the connection between the orders and the region's growing banner problem. Worse, none of the guards seemed to care about Chow and his friends' regular trips out of the valley at night, or nor their regular, barely covert dips in his supplies. It took you long enough, said Chow. As a man rode toward him on a horse, it was dark. There were crates of supplies stacked beside him. I was this close to giving your order to another very interested buyer. You will not dare stand against the forces of the National Protection Army of China. Yeah, yeah, I've heard the lecture. 
We're all very grateful for your brave and patriotic service. Chiang Kai Shek would be proud of you if he were here today. Chiao cocked his head. <clears throat> Just tell me if you have my money. There was a moment of silence as the National Protection Army messenger seethed. Then, whirls, he removed a thick roll of bills from his jacket. Chiao grabbed and thumbed, thumbed through the packet, feeling its oil against his skin before shoving it beneath the prisoner's uniform. He found the normal supply of explosives and mining tools tucked into the crates alongside some small guns we got off bandits a few weeks back after they raided a government warehouse. I uh, said, Chiao, it won't be enough to demolish the government, but probably enough to cause some mayhem. Should I put you down for another shipment? The messenger nodded. We'll need all the weapons we can get for what's coming. Keep the cash flow and I'll see what I can do. Landlords must have their say. In our past, right now, and most likely in the future, the great state of Yunnan has had to relocate vast numbers of people, along with their towns and farms, for economic or political reasons. And this we have violated the rights of many of our subjects, not the peasants. They'll go where they are sent, and they'll be grateful to better serve Yunnan. We're talking about the poor landlords. Our landlord populations have their traditional rights ignored. Their privileges are being overlooked, or so they say. Already influential Yi families who form the vast majority of our nation's landlord class are forming Yi societies and expressing discontent with their government. As an enemy we need as a friend. We also need their money. These societies that are amicable to our needs shall be gathered in a congress of friendly societies. This body will act as an advisory and lobbying board for the landlords with a side effect of acting as a lever we can lean on to help the landlords make the right decisions. Midnight robbery. The only sounds that filled the night were those of local wildlife. The bandits turned soldiers of the NRA waited around the road for the shipment to arrive. A truck full of Japanese weapons and equipment were due to be delivered to the Burmese. Their mission was simply to intercept it, preventing the Japanese from bolstering their own garrisons and supplying the NRA with more weapons to be used in the liberation of China. As the sound of the truck came into range, the NRA soldiers prepared themselves. When the optimal time arrived, they sprung into action, and the ensuing fight was bloody as it was swift, in order to prevent any witnesses from reporting what happened to the Japanese. Not a single person was spared from the NRA's wrath. When the fighting had finished, the soldiers disposed of the bodies by rolling them down the mountainside. The surgeons commandeer the trucks and deliver the shipments to the NRA. This raid is far from unique. Each night, several NRA teams conduct similar operations, stealing supplies, blowing up railways, assassinating local officials, all with the aim of either disrupting the Japanese or strengthening the NRA's position. While in isolation, each incident would be a relatively small blow to Japanese power in the region, they quickly add up to considerable disruption of Japanese hegemony. And every night, more operations are carried out than the last. Soon, we'll reach a tipping point. Motorized is not doing great. Guns are not... Guns are looking really good now. Wow. Lee Kiwi. A chilly wind blew through the park as Long Yun and Luhan walked through the orange leaves and dying light of the sun as it sank slowly beneath the horizon. Some distance behind were the bodyguards, ever alert for the rogue elements even in this relatively peaceful place. Though nowhere was truly peaceful these days. Luhan turned his head and noticed a small crater pooling water and withered stems just to the left of the truck. He stopped and watched it for a moment. One can never get away from the war, can they? Even here, reach the grenades and bombs, though Luhan had meant it just as a passing comment. For some reason, it seemed to agitate his cousin considerably. Long Yun made as if to say something, stopped, and then turned to face the vivid red sunset. And after watching it wordlessly, he said, What do you see, the, see there? That's an odd question. That was f quickly falling, and the thin coats they both wore were not enough to keep the ever-increasing chill. Just before the sun dipped entirely out of view, Luhan responded, How far away were we from home? In Jiao Tong, the mountains entirely blocked the sunset. The rest of the journey they walked in silence. The bodyguard suggested a different route home than they usually took as an extra precaution, so Luhan was left alone to ponder what had been meant by the question. Was it, was it philosophical? Moral? As a senior in both years and experience as a leader of men, Long Yun often tried to play. The teacher and open-ended rules were usually part of that, but this seemed different, simpler. There was no one on the street that evening as he reached home, bidding his protection farewell, still none the wiser as to what he was supposed to have said. When the bodyguard reached home, his duties had not yet ended. There was a package to deliver for the men hiding in the mountains. As he braced himself against the weather, it suddenly struck him. A simple little truth, but the whole truth nonetheless, and it was no wonder Luhan had failed to realize the sun is setting, and in comes the winter. But the road from Mandalay. Smuggler's job was by no measure easy. He had no ally to save his client, and face every enemy imaginable. Yeah, pretty normal. The local authorities, bandits and criminals, and at the times, rivals in the business, and even nature herself, with all her rugged mountains and buffaloing woodlands and treacherous cold nights. He had to travel alone or the best in a pair. Numbers would draw attention and interception. And the KMT was shot for men regardless, but that meant he was helpless against any desperate group of outlaws stalking the ones or two roads which were in good enough shape for smuggling purposes. He had his pistol in ten years' experience, but that meant nothing to the raiders with rifles strapped to their backs and two decades of crime on their record. Fortunately for the smuggler, though, we'll have it gone a bit easier with a recent reno uh, renovation and reopening of the old Burma Road, where he had once had to drag and push his cargo through muddy paths whilst looking forward and definitely avoiding bandit parties hidden behind the foliage on the wayside. He now had the luxury of <clears throat> an open paved road unplagued by ambushes. Not to mention the far more direct connection meaning a shorter journey. The only downside perhaps was that the increased police presence on the road, but they were thankfully too preoccupied hunting the raiders and tracking insurgents to notice of the people supplying those insurgents. Besides, the government hadn't been that compliant or competent to crack down on corruption, so a good bribe could always solve any s sticky situation. 
All in all, the smuggler thought everyone was made happy. The people were happy with the improved and safer road. The government was happy with the economic growth it brought. He was happy with his job being made a little bit less difficult. And his bosses were happy with the more consistent deliveries of the crucial supplies and cash he brought. The road has been too successful. But, after landlords had their say, look the other way. The Congress of Friendly Society has been an un almost unmitigated success. Landlords are turning up in droves uh, to have their say and rub shoulders with the good and the great and the great estate of Jinan. Some of their suggestions aren't terrible, which has been has surprised us to no end, but they may benefit us in ways we do not even imagine. The almost unmitigated part of that success is the fact that the Congress has revealed that the illustrious behavior of our noble landlords is not always above board. We are receiving worrying reports, tenants being terrorized, extorted, and abused, workers having their wages stolen or not even promised, many of our peasants are little more than slaves. The junior minister who compiled this report has been quietly promoted to somewhere irrelevant. The report itself has been carefully misfilled in a report on rice spoil spoilage and tenures of hygiene committee m m minutes. This is not a concern. This is a private matter between our landlords and their tenants. The world will forget this, but neither the landlords or ourselves will. The reassurance. When the landlords in the region surrounding Baoshan came in for the conference with Wang Xiaoyuan, Yunnan's economy tsar, their faces show with various levels of concern. Some of them less familiar with the way the Yunnan government functioned and came in looking worried, afraid that their privileges would be abrogated. As part of Gao Zongwu's modernization, others more antiquated with the government were less than sanguine. As Wang made the announcement, the faces of the landlords became more and more relaxed. By the decree of the governor of Yunnan, General Luhan, with the approval of the government, governing council, we of the government of Yunnan believe in a rational and reasoned approach to the implementation of the modernization program set by His Excellency the President Gao Zongwu. One of the major corollaries of this doctrine is to an avoidance of reckless and communistic exportation tactics. Land of the tiller, and is there such insane slogans with lack of understanding of even the most basic eco economics and governance will have no hearing here. Therefore, it follows by necessity that there will be neither seizures nor appropriations without the consent of those consulted. Landlords shall have their say, and we shall respect it at all costs. The landlords rose in applause and identity. Thumbing through antiquated photographs of her husband, Madame Sonia Sem ignored the constant ringing of the telephone on her desk. The collaborator government had become more insistent with time, almost desperate in the demanding of her affirmation that they were the true heirs of Dr. Sun's legacy. What nonsense. She had stopped picking up the phone altogether, or, other, or her, her other correspondence was all via telegram or letter, so it mattered little. She squinted at the photos. Many had been captured during this time as Grand Marshal and leader of the KMT in Guangzhou, but a few predated even Xinhai. Those were the images of him as his true self, the revolutionary idealist she had known. They all, though, were decades old, many blurred and distorted due to the primitive technologies of the time and the wearing of age. To say Sun Yat-sen was a great man would be a tremendous understatement, but his ideas, like the photos, have faded and corrupted over the 40 years since his death. The KMT had moved far away from the revolutionaries' original ideas and intentions, and although she detested the way they had fallen from the grace, neither would she herself seek to stand solely in her husband's shadow. She had her own vision, one of equality and freedom for all under China, for the people and the workers. If the nation was to rise from the ashes, a new political movement would have to rise alongside it. There would never be again another be a Madame Sonia Sam. There would only be Song Ching Ling from then on. Heed their advice. When we first proposed the Congress of Friendly Societies, we fully intended it to be nothing but a sh talking shop. A side short of the institutions that actually matter in the great state of Jinan, but the fine new gentlemen of Jinan has surprised us. Some of them have terrible some of them have ideas that aren't terrible. Accumulated experience of generations of landlords have produced minds more methodical in their extraction of wealth and labor than any of that say in the halls of government. They propose new methods of organizing their peasants, communal living, portable and temporary houses so we don't have the terrific expense of relocating the peasants every time a new bane is discovered, and the past attempts to concentrate peasants have been fought by landlords eager to protect their rents, but the Congress has approved or proposed a brilliant notion of rent by tenant rather than rent by building. In this way, cooperation between landlords can reduce the cost while each tenant continues to pay the respective landlord what they're owed. This system is the added benefit of enabling us to transplant workers a great distance yet ensuring that they still pay the original landlord the rent they owe. We'll take a cut to cover the cost of transport and the landowners or landlords that can buy and sell tenancies of tenancies among themselves. Some say this is slavery with extra steps, but we prefer to describe it as freedom with fewer steps. Looking the other way. Bye, I've told you with this a thousand times. This stuff will kill you. It is barely better than what we rested the vagabonds with. Night nah, patrols were never the most exciting adventures for Kunming's finest. They were more likely to catch a jaywalker than an international terrorist. Lee tried his best to not drift away in a blissful sleep, a battle in which he was losing. Oh, please, Bai scoffed. I didn't pay attention to history classes that much, but I don't remember tobacco causing the downfall of our nation. Did you, you never even showed up to it? At least stopped his ears perking. Did you hear that? Sounds like a little bit of banging around there. There's a few doors down from where the car was parked. The unmistakable sounds of violence could be heard, shattering 
A ceramic pain scream. Primal yelled. Something was going down. Bosch shook out of his daze and threw a cigar out the window instinctively. He reached for his nabu and stumbled out of the car. This is a police. Lee knocked. Open up. Lee knocked again. Practically, practically slamming his knuckles on the red hardwood door. Nothing. Lee kicked down the door by following hot pursuit. In the dining room, a burly man, tall man, was kicking a much scrawnier man lying on the floor, unmoving. On face by the two police officers pointing their weapons at him, the tall man continued to swing his boot into the man's stomach. It was only then that Lee saw the man's face, of course. When when Yi was the tall man's name, a landlord. Lee never met the man, but he knew enough to know that he had influence over the city. Bai walked away from the scene, disgusted, but as he walked, judging. But he walked. Judging by the lack of a reaction, Yi knew that he was invincible to the police. He was right. The orders from above were to ignore the unsolvables. When it came to the landlords, unless one wanted to find themselves unemployed, all Lee could do was look on as each bone-cracking kick was delivered. One day it would be different. One day, nobody would be above the law, but not now. Lee gave a short bow and left. Something has to give. Where are we at here? Is it still going down? That's good. We're not going to touch anything else here, then. And the economy? Well, we have no more supplies. But the growth is looking pretty good. We're doing decent. Heed their advice. The courier. Cao Xiang Yu's job as a house arrest officer was far from the granites of works available to men. To surveil a man who didn't leave his home was about as mundane as an existence that is that bequeathed upon the man that he imprisoned. Indeed, to stop someone from leaving his home leaves you more confined than him. At least he was in his own home. Well, where is Zheng Yu? One of the small requests that punctuated the smooth line of scheduled existence rang out with a small bell. Zheng Zuliang sat at the study, a musty old room filled with the smell of wood and books and the dust that couldn't go away. There were letters, a pile so high that some of them had wet ink while many were dry to the bone. These would be delivered, Zeng said. The addresses are already on all of them. Sir, they're there to a great deal of places. Cao Suoli took a look at his first letter on the list and saw some place in Hubei that I'd never heard of. Another in Xinjiang. There wasn't even a letter there was even a letter addressed to Yunnan. Did that even belong to the government? At least he recognized the fourth letter, but flipping through made him quite ashamed of his geographical skills. He looked at Zeng, who was given an incredulous look. It's not like you have to run to all the places, Zeng said. Don't we have a car now? Cal looked at the letters again, then back at Zeng. It was work and work his work and work his duty. It'll be done. A government of friends, a Congress of Affluence today, or has today been declared to the Congress. An official wing of a government dedicated to representing the land and moneyed interests. As a bold new step toward democracy, as now hundreds of people in the great state of Yunnan will be represented. We're not giving them any power in particular, but we're not we're ensuring that they work closely with our ministers on the, on every issue. They'll pass a commentary on every law and can put recommendations to us for the consideration. These recommendations are often accompanied by gifts, voluntary special taxes paid to ministers and the government as a whole. There are those who call this new system bribery, but that shows a very immature understanding of politics. These are very simply lobbyists, keen to show up the interests of the relevant sectors of our society. The money favors that exchange hands are simply the logical extension of the friendly advice we exchange. Increasingly, our ministers are retiring from government service to become landlords, while landlords are now our first pick when we seek new recruits for office. The land class and the government are coming closer together in a true government of friends. Words are choosing to close. Or to come, I should say. It's been extraordinarily... Like, like a normal day, like any other for a son, Liren, with a healthy run through the woods supplemented by much other exercise. This has been his daily life for over a decade now, of course. And even if the winds of change began to blow in China, Sun did not thought the wind would reach him so soon, arriving back at his house upon the completion of his exercise. When Nanjing wa uh, oh, he found a single letter that left at his door. That, that itself was curious enough. When Nanjing wanted something from him, it, as it rarely did, it always had someone to meet him in person. Whoever had left this letter he did not want to be overheard. After glancing from side to side, Sun picked up the letter and swiftly went into the house, shutting the door firmly behind him. Opening the envelope gingerly, he took the letter out and unfolded it, letting the envelope fall to the ground as he did so. The first thing that came to his attention was impossible to miss, a name that had been had for decades ranked among those that most raw vowed by the Japanese, Zhang Zuilang. Though Sun had regrettably only ever been an acquaintance of Marshal Zhang, he had heard well enough of his fate after the war, a continuation of the house arrest that Xing had given him, to be confined without trial until the end of his life. Sun had never known why Zhang seemed to have gone off relatively lightly. Then again, perhaps the Japanese thought the worst punishment the Marshal could suffer would be seeing the ruination they brought upon China. Encouraged by the sight of the name of such a respectable man, Sun began to read the letter. In short, the letter was nothing short of an invitation to treason. With a request for Sun's advice on whether or not an open rebellion against the government betraying its own people is wise, Though the Nanjing government is never mentioned by the name of the letter, its meaning is clear enough, with many references to the justice faced by famous traitors of Chinese history. So it will be a lesser man if he did not answer in the affirmative. Dear Marshal Zeng, we'll catch you later. Hmm... NRA, huh? Slightly more stability now. Not bad.
There you go. Let's see. Function of administ administration is at least that's not bad, but still. But order in progress. The machinery of the state has always been as strong as you know, but it was also was also very loud. Riots and demonstrations, constant pushback against our goals, neighbors who look down on us for a few days a year, they remember we exist. A country where every scrap of produce had to be dragged over tree roots and below creepers. These things exist now only in our memory and the well censored pages of our history books. Now in the great state of Jinan demands something that is done quickly and quietly. We don't even have to raise our voices. Where once we blasted the problems like a torrent, now we flow through them like a river. By the time we finish fixing a problem, no one's even yet realized there was one. These days, all Jinan and Broad knows the strength of the state and knows the strength to change minds as easily as it changes mountain ranges. We are one state, one nation, one people all marching in town to the beat of our government's drum. Once we were afraid the future would pass us by. Every day we're now threatened to pass the future. This is Jinan yesterday, this is Jinan today, and it shall be Jinan tomorrow. Nice. And good company. And how are you doing? Enjoying yourself, I hope. Thank you very much. And for that gift, by the way, do keep it well now. No, I haven't forgotten. Remind me later so we can talk more about it, yes? Oh, excuse me. L Lee, come here. There's someone, or someone you must simply, must simply meet. It was through the smiling murmurs of his invitees in response to his brisk flattery that Luhan knew that hosting the party had been worth his time. In attendance were several of his ministers, a gaggle of warlords and landlords from across the province, and even some businessmen represented as a companies that lay across the border in China. They all gathered in celebration of Jinan's revival, a miracle in the southwest, proving that the province can stand not as some glorified fiefs and afforded independence by Nanjing, but on its own two feet as a proper part of the sphere, an event that Lu was sure to commemorate. Wandering away from the bustle of the party with a drink in hand to take in the night air for a moment, Luan couldn't help but look back on the assembled men who smiled self-assuredly. Jinan had become what it meant to be or due to the system of men like him, a powerhouse that was fully realized of its own worth and capabilities, and one that Japan was learned to rely on. Luan was master of the Southwest, and he wasn't going anywhere anytime soon. Truly, what did he have to fear from his enemies nowadays? The ragged remnants of the NRA in the hills? Certainly, they would have to fall on f far too low to be anything more than a pack of roving dogs. The idea almost made Luan laugh. Gazing out in the cover of night, the radiant moon burned against, burning against it. It felt as though Jinan was coming to the end of a chapter of violence. Soon, they would be free of the petty conflicts of bandits and continue on a secure path, even if it was one where the stones were paid by Japan. His predecessors would have balked at such an idea. Kai would surely be spinning in his grave at the idea of it all, and Lu knew all too well of his cousin Lu Long Yun's disapproval of his methods, regrettable though it was. But in the end, it was Lu Han who was at the top and not them. Pondering victory in the night, Lu Han drank deeply in the fruits of our labor. With money, you are a dragon. Without it, you are a worm. Once we were but a worm, digging in the dirt, but now we're the dragon of the south, but we, but we still dig. We dig the fields that feed millions of people, our own and our customers. We dig the wealth of nature out of the very mountainside. We dig roads and pathways. We dig deep in ourselves, and when we think we can no longer stand, when we can no longer work, we find the strength to carry on. When we began the program of enrichment, there were those doubters who thought that it was far too ambitious, that Jinan was too backwards and insignificant to become an economic powerhouse. We, well, then, we've dealt with these traders in more than one. Our economy is no longer developing, it's developed. We're not just a great state, we're a great state. We're in a great state. Our labor is finally bearing fruit. Now we can just get down to spending money, not just making it. You can know the research lot. Whoa. Oh, that's really good, actually. Well, we go to what? Oh, we just jump up with industrial base. Nice. The hour is coming. Zhang Zemin was right. When Zhang's underground network obtained the critical information that Lu Han was planning a holiday trip in Baoshan and further that Long Yun would be in charge of the government during Lu's absence, Zhang understood at once. Drafting a letter, he asked his secretary, actually an underground party agent, delivered to the CPC remnants in Vietnam. In the days that followed, he started mobilizing the dissidents and supporters to be ready for the inevitable takeover at once a coup had happened. He also sent letters to the Sichuan resistance, advising them to prepare for their own share in the anti-Japanese revolt. Far in the south, in Viet Minh controlled territory, Yi Jiang Ying is reading Yi Jiang's letter. A wide smile crossed his face and his hand shook with uncontrollable enthusiasm. He decided to leave matters of mobilization to his staff. He and his two aides de camps, Yang Dezhi and Yang Cheng Wu, rushed to Kunming for early preparations via the Kunming Haifeng Railway. Not much was requested or required in terms of preparations. Jing had already prepared the necessary cover-ups and disguise for them to board the train and head north, but he had one last thing to do before he left. He had a friend to say goodbye to. Ho Chi Minh, to be exact. While his officers packed his bags, Yi left for Ho's residence. The 11th hour. Well, Long Yun and Zhe Sheng and An Anpu planned a war of national liberation. The governor of Yuyan, Yunnan, Lu Han, came moving on as if nothing was happening. That was a given. Given the fact that Liu had no reason to know uh, anything was happening. So far as Liu knew, his cousin and his lieutenants were an important and valuable part of Liu Yunnan's share in the five modernizations, and none of them gave him any reason to believe otherwise. So it made sense that the governor was very happy with the way things were going. Jinan was growing more and more prosperous by the day. The intellectuals, over the NSAU that blathered about bloody industrialization and playing the civic into the Yamato scum, were just blind to the real benefits of his work. Gao Zongwu, on the other hand, was not. Liu had just now received a missive from him 
commending Yunnan and Yunnan's contributions to the five modernizations. We have 9% growth, Jesus Christ. It helped, of course, to know that the insurgencies were not enough to stop Yunnan's progress into the modern age. Accordingly, Lu Han, always one for a good celebration, decided to hold a great countryside gathering in commemoration of his successes, invite many sphere delegates and dignitaries. The first person he told of this was his trusted second command, his cousin Long Yun. When he heard the words from his cousin's mouth, uh, his warlord instincts, honed over years of ruling Yunnan, told him that the time was, come, was to come soon. Just like when he had thrown Tiang Ji Yao down all those years ago, the moment was very near. So Long, calling Zeng and An to his side, and gave them instructions to get the NPA prepared and sat them down to write a letter alert the NRA and remnants to mobilize, for war was soon to come. The farewell. Oh crap. The farewell. I want to finish this focus first. Ho Chi Minh and Yi Jing Ying's farewell was a brief affair. Though it seemed like the two of them were keeping their emotions under check, those who knew them knew whether they were both deeply saddened. It made sense, after all, way back in the time before the Japanese imperialists masquerading as liberated seized control of Asia from Primorsk to Puktak, the Chou Chi Minh had gone north to what was at the time officially known as the Shangong Ning border region. While there, he had met a CCP general and been appointed as secretary, and the two became close friends over the years. That man was Marshal Yi Zheng Ying. After some more brief words, reminiscences, advice, and so on, and one last drink of rice wine, Yi and Ho walked together to the train station undercover. Ho prevailed upon Yi to let him carry at least one of Yi's bags, as he had done back in the day, though Yi was reticent at first, given Ho's old age. He at last greeted and gave him the slightest bag he could. At last, the two embraced and parted. Ho for his home, and Yi for his seat in the train. At, as one got settled in a seat and the others got back to his house, a single tear left each of their eyes. It was all the evidence they would give of the grief of parting. And take a day off. Huh. Kunming is a city that never sleeps. The factories are as active in the night as the daytime, and all around ships give the hours of the day as much predictability as well as drill and navy ship. The people are frugal and thin. It's rare that any of them are given a chance to develop the sins of greed, gluttony, or sloth on the backs of such workers as carried the great state of Jinan. We've asked so much of these people, and they have supplied it. They've asked for nothing, and we, shall have, we have responded in kind. We all deserve a celebration, and all deserve to take a day to eat, drink, and be merry. Suppose we gather the many miles of revenue we'll, we have used in opening ceremonies will be recycled, I'll send a diplomat to secure the celebrities and dignitaries from across the sphere to act as guests of honor. Let the roads throng with their peasants, let the, their bellies and their pockets be filled. Let every friend of the government give thanks and drink deep. This day will be a celebration for everyone. The workers will know it as Labor Day, the landlord shall know it as Business Day, and our ministers shall know it as Government Day. But everyone, for now and forever, will always know today is Jinan Day. Li Dong. Or Li Dong. 65, 10% would be really nice. Let's grab some more land night attack too. The sky was dark and electric, and oil lamps could only do so much against the gloom. Sometimes a gust of wind would strike him, and Chen would wince. Although dressed in several layers of wool and clothing, scarves, shirts, coats, and jackets, he would never get used to the winter air. Up here, Chen thought that he would see snow. No such luck. They began to climb in the evening hours, just as the sun was starting to set. The light blood until it disappeared beyond the mountains, leaving him and his group in the company of the silhouettes of the range, jagged and coarse against a star of the sky lit by a moon occasionally obscured by wisps of clouds. It rained in the afternoon, and now the road was mud and slippery. Chen's rubber boots were soaked in them, and against the slant of the path, it was sometimes hard to go on. And now and again, the road would curve. If anyone slipped, it meant certain death. During the Second Sino Japanese War, the KMT used this road to bring supplies from British India into Yunnan. Even now, it was no different. For the past few years, the Burmese branch of the National Revolutionary Army had been sending supplies up the old road. Rifles, pistols, uniforms, food, artillery guns, and shells were among the items that Chen had seen packaged and sent to Yunnan. Today, the gift was something unique. In his back pocket were the bells of yen and yuan, currency for the war ahead. Chen drew a deep breath. Though the chilly winter air was silent and still, it was as if he could hear the sounds within those mountains. A so steady rumble echoed in his ears and soon all erupt, and China would never be the same. A lot of kaboom was well, going to come. Nice. And yeah, we're trying to build like a robot. I'm not too concerned about that stuff right now. How are we doing for weaponry? Got 5,000 rifles almost in storage. Oh, 60 a day is good. Artillery is one and a half, not bad. Oh, we actually have two and two divisions. Look at that. I didn't realize that. We might need a defender, but we'll see. Wow. The departure. After several days of preparations and saying invitations, Zhu Han was ready to fly to the Baoshan region in the western Yunnan for his well-deserved rest. He called his cousin or friend Long Yun to see him off at the airport. Here now, cousin, I need you to do something for me, Lu said. Long Yun nodded willingly, as he always had it these past 50 years. What is it? Lu Han nodded in acknowledgement. While well, I'm off to Baoshan for well-deserved rest, can you take care of the government for me? <laughs> it won't be longer than a few days. Yeah, totally. Uh, Long had done this before. He knew the drill quite well. Nodding ob obligingly, he agreed. Of course, cousin, more than willing to help you, make sure to enjoy your journey. Lou, not noticing anything amiss, nodded his thanks. Thank you so much, cousin. I leave it all in your trustworthy hands. With that, he embraced the cousin and boarded the plane, sitting down and relaxing. At last, his efforts were all coming to fruition. Surely he deserved a brief vacation after his well-devoted work for his Yunnan in China. 
The long union on the other hand turned away to put his plans into motion. Oh boy, just taking a casual day off, my friends. Just one day off. We all need a day off from time to time. When is that, though? And yet shadows gather. High wrong sweat dripped from his brow, the tapping of his long nails against a wooden desk, each tap like clockwork, bringing some small tranquil in what was a turbulent, suffocating room given graciously by the window of the minor worker. Because, of course, in this hecko, it's workers who suffer. Leaving destitute wives who can barely raise their children who grow weaker and trailer to likely die working. As glance furtively goes to the right, past the soldier he brought to this meeting. If it came to the worst, gazing past the window to the starry night of Balshan, and he can't but help but wonder and ponder. I remember better, more hopeful days, and always shook him off of his stupor. The telltale sign of a jeep cutting through the night with the lights off. The roar of the engine dying as it stopped near the house. Hai Rong risked a lot up to his own personal beliefs, sending a meeting with his man, but the savior of Yunnan out to party and drink. There wouldn't be there wouldn't ever be any better opportunity. It really wasn't time to focus on beliefs when so much was on the line. <clears throat> One, two, three, the car lights or headlights flashed, followed by two consecutive ones, and Hai realized, or at least a pent-up breath he didn't know he was holding. Even if his hand didn't escape the single service pistol he still holds, turning to a single companion, he muttered the first of what will be hopefully a very productive meeting, to Anna to let him in. Now we're in immediate. Why do we go to 214? Hmm. That's going to affect the growth now. Wow, look at that. Not bad. Cool. 17. Holy cow. We definitely need way more fuel, though. Um, I don't mind going to 2, maybe, then. To 16. Not bad. Just casually taking a day off. Oh, nothing bad could happen, right? Two clips of sun. <clears throat> Anything else here we really care about? Probably not. Long Yun has, in his long life, seen all sort of weaponry wielded and used against each other. Rifles, pistols, mortars, bombs, poisons, in his long service to China or people. He saw the byproducts of her children. <clears throat> Screaming in anguish or tears, their gaze weakly glancing around fading faces, desperate to find one it could recognize quickly enough to give parting words, to be apologies or favors for the living ones to communicate their next of kin while they passed away in an unceremonious silence. <clears throat> That is, if they would even be granted that honor, he certainly wouldn't give the Japanese and their sympathizers any. Hatred is humanity's finest, deadliest weapon, because she is formless and shapeless like water, easily able to enter every nook and cranny of a person before putting them to the ultimate test, one of resilience and focus. If they broke, hatred would break them, leaving them a screaming, incomprehensible mad dog to be put down. But if they accepted, nurtured it even, hatred would strengthen them, sharpen the instincts of their minds and their will, even feed the fickle flame that fuels their life, giving them a bit more time to deal with the cause of the righteous fury. Luhan was out on a vacation paid by the cost of the people he exploited, and Yoon dearly hoped that he would feast to his heart's content, as every man should be able to enjoy their last days. For Luhan is a dead man walking, dancing alongside those who will soon follow. But the economy, my friends, almost 10% growth. Amazing. And I have still having a surplus and very little inflation for he who has lost the mandate. The super alcohol was still addling Lu Han's mind as he slammed open the door to the governor's office, only to find himself staring into the cold, pitch black barrels of the rifle. All six, no seven of them unbudgingly pointing his way. He stopped dead in his tracks, took one good look at the pale figure perched behind what was supposed to be his own desk, and instantly the drunken haze evaporated. You and he blurted out, no, what the F? Him all people, please, what do you think you're. Guard, sure, savior of you now on the exit. Long Yun murmured, his gaze vacant towards the floor, visage drained of emotion. <clears throat> or emotion. For one single fleeting instant, Luan felt he saw a flash of pain whisking across his cousin's face. Take this disgrace to the Yi away and let judgment from our brothers and sisters be delivered unto him. Whatever happens to him thereafter, I leave to your discretion. What are you? Luhan barely blurted out a word before the handcuffs came bearing down upon his wrist. No, listen here, you son of a heck. Or whore. His, uh, son, his legs flailed as the guards yanked him by the shoulder towards the door. Don't you dare tell me what to do. Everything I've done, I've done for China. Don't you effing get it? I swear to the heaven's eye. His grumbles, of course, went unheeded as he was escorted out of his former office. In his place, row after row of ministers filing into the door as if on command. Long, faces Long Yoon uh, had known since long ago. His old subjects, his old comrades, all proffering utmost salutations to the restored leader, a rekindled vigor flickering in their eyes. It was then there that the king of the southwest finally lifted his head content and has cast his gaze upon a homeland reclaimed soon to be unshackled from subjugation and treachery forevermore first some house cleaning to do the king of yunnan has returned since his exile from his rightful throne today it shall be reshaped and china will never be the same again the sphere won't react well to the news again as such we're forced to pursue autarky losing much of the economic ties and cooperation achieved under lu han's regime however we're not done or we're not alone that the insurgencies around will lend his hand against the hostile forces and the power will determine how much strength they can offer us oh crap Welcome back, Long Yun. Welcome back. Factor in how many divisions the country aims to produce? 
Hopefully a lot more. Oh boy. King of the Southwest. Long Yun, the once ruler of Yunnan, has returned to his throne in Kunming. Though the armed resistance to his rule continues elsewhere in the province, the seat of power in the provincial capital centralizes authority. It's now time to resume the war of national resistance. The Japanese cannot be allowed to remain in China any further. The Nanshi government, that is their puppet, do not represent the Chinese people and their ousters wished by all. From the bourgeoisie of Chinese society, they're lowest pleasant. In a seat of power, the men and women of the province have clamored for a return to rule by a proper nationalist government. The Nanjing government may declare themselves to be the true heirs of Sun Yat-sen, but the force of arms, like during the first northern expedition, shall determine who rules China and who does not. Legacy of the regime, actually, yeah, the economy is probably tanked. Yeah, 4% growth, Jesus Christ. But this stuff shouldn't really matter anymore anyway, so. Uh, patriotism. Ooh, Max Book of Power Game. Because we can only, from what I know, you can, we can only go so far with this. Like, there's only so much we can do before we, uh, I think have the war, I think? Tenacity. Fortify the border. It's not bad. Mountain people. That's pretty good to get, actually. Mm, that's not bad either. Combat basing. Add combat schooling. Loyalty. Police with security service. Not bad. Uh, Alright, not terrible. Complacent peasants. Academic base. What did you do in the war? Oh, we get three free production units. We 16. We're getting more would be really good. Public trials. Even more political power game. Down with the traitors. Even more political power game. Wow. Atta oh, that's... Ooh. Attack bonus against the following country. That's really strong, too. 20% more worship would be so nice. Four-year draft. New Zealand's officer staff. Okay. Uh, War machine. Not bad. Banned from service. Total service equality. Six more infantry divisions. Ooh, that's pretty strong, too. Chinese army unbowed. Oh, my goodness. Military professional rapidly improve industry. Close economy. Remove export focus. Uh, that's not bad, too. By Long's command. Whoever, wherever, however. Ooh, that kind of hurts us, though. I don't like that one too much. Everything for the war. Oh, my goodness. Well, I definitely want the free production units. I, and I definitely want more divisions. Rapidly improve is not bad. This one's okay. As much as I want extra political power, I don't think that's going to be extremely helpful. I mean, encryption decryption is really good for combat as well. But that attack and defense bonus against China would be so important to get. <sighs> Mountain people is really good too. All these are really good. I think I want to go with honor first. Because even though we lose the recruitable population factor, we're still China. Or a China. Oh, we'll conquer more territory as the year goes on. Before your draft, anyways. Um, you get three production units. You get a lot of equipment and six more divisions. Let's go with honor. We have failed our forebears. The memory of the northern expedition has crumbled, and the war that destroyed our nation in 1933 has been forgotten. The Japanese and the weak willed Chinese collaborator states that dead, untold damage to the people seizing the, our produce, our industrial products, among a long and terrible list of misdeeds. We must rekindle the sentiments of the past to win the future. We must not forget the sacrifices, however vain, that our fathers and grandfathers laid down for us. A war is not just a scheme to set China free, it's a chance to restore the ancient legacy that has been since then forgotten. Oh, what type of divisions do we have? We have two, two 15 templates. Not terrible. And 215. Oh, even better. Wow. So you guys are just 18. You guys are like the guys. Seven of those guys. We have. This are 12 of these guys. And four. You know, 12 of these guys. There are 12. Wait. Oh, you have recon on yourselves. Okay, that's not terrible either. Um, and then you guys have. 15. Even though these guys are the best, probably, so. Oh. Old man. Um. Well, on Empu. Yeah, probably. Field Marshal. Long Yun. Reckless. Harsh Leader. Organizer. Offensive Doctrine. Throw Planner. What type of guy? Logistics. Definitely logistics from China. Um, I could try that maybe, but... By Yi for now, I guess. 
And we'll set it up like this too. We'll definitely have to wait and see how this war goes. When we get there, so. 4% growth, not bad. A lot more inflation though now, which does suck. Return of the King. It was all very fast when it happened. Soldiers and civilians, many of them affiliated with the National Protection Army, who were told that the governor's esteemed cousin was about to make a speech, gathered in front of the stage and couldn't meet. They did not expect General Long Yun to make a powerful speech, saying that Lu Han, the man he once venerated as a great honorable warrior for free China, was dead and the one that remained was more of a mere running dog of the jabs and pills, and Wang Jing Wei's brainwashed slaves in Nanjing. Nor, for that matter, did they expect Long Yun to name himself King Yunnan again or to pledge to demand justice and fairness for his people. The people were pleasantly surprised and began to applaud. The MPA was loud in its approval. Zheng Zesheng and An Empu were very satisfied with what they saw. They were even happy to witness a sta army standing to arms, changing its loyalty and saluting its new leader. At the same time, the National Associated now Southwest University made its move, mobilizing the connections in cities under the call of Wang Zhao Yu. They forced those local officials, then already defected to surrender under insurmountable pressure. The peasants in rural areas, often inflamed by the NSAU linked agitators, did much the same, putting down those that had exploited them for no so long with the help of incoming partisans from Vietnam. Those members of the police that were not long with Long Yun also gave in quickly when they saw that the army was not with them. With the lone messenger, pursued by the MPA forces, reached Nanjing to tell Gao Zong Wu what had happened, it was too late. By the time Gao processed the news long enough to put his head in his hands, Long Yun had solidified control of the whole of Jinan, and even Sichuan is under the threat of the MPA now. Jinan is Long Yun's to rule. Sichuan stands in the balance between us and Gao Zong Wu. Local guerrillas, Liu Wenhui's Zhi Kang clique, and local garrisons were both factors and tools in a struggle for them to control the region. We can allow Sichuan to fall in, into the enemy's hands. And Sichuan's right here, right? Oh, you can. Oh, there's lore? Okay, that's kind of cool. Shay? Am I wrong? Is such one Jing Kang? Greece who? So I don't know my Chinese geography that well. Yeah, this is all Yunnan Kunming. Uh, well, whatever. Um, in the meantime, clash and okay. So what do we have? Political power and influence. We actually get some political power now. Which now? MPA influence at R C O R G O C. Fun partisans. Offer partisans few funds to help them operate more effectively. Send weapons to partisans. Send a few men of elite forces to ensure that our weapons will be exactly sent to the partisans. Ambush them. So we probably want more here. MPA support. So clashing switch one. Groups and switch one are clashing. Faction support and influence will fall between five to twenty and one to two respectively. Our influence will mainly depend on how much support we have invested in the region. Approximately fifteen to thirty percent of our support level will be converted to our influence level. Proceed, Liu Wenhui. If you want to build that, please go ahead. Switch one struggle ends. We want to leave nothing to his enemy. So we probably want to send more weapons, right? How many guns do we got? 4200 is not bad. We need more motorized, though. Ambush them? Thanks to the heli train of uh, Sejuan. We can send our mountainous forces to target wandering RGOC officials to cripple the administration of the local government, hindering their progress against the partisans. Send 500. Support level 10. We'll see what happens. And we'll do this once I have some more influence. But I think we're going to end it there. Because I want to see actually what we can do. Maybe a little bit off screen and then get ready for the war. The, the, the end of war basically against the Republic of China. Basically against the sphere, which is going to be god awful. But if you enjoyed the video, leave a like. Subscribe if you're new. Check out my Discord link in the description below. And see you tomorrow when things are really going to explode. Thanks for watching. Have a great rest of your day.